Saint Germain Cousin found God in the fields she worked, the sheep she watched over, and even her own suffering. Despite terrible abuses from her stepmother and abject neglect from her father, Germaine lived each day with patience and compassion for everybody she encountered. Germaine was born in 1579 to poor parents. Her father was a farmer, and her mother died when she was still an infant. She was born with a deformed right arm and hand, as well as the disease of scrofula, a tubercular condition. Her father remarried soon after the death of her mother, but his new wife was filled with disgust by Germaine's condition. Little Germaine had been given so little food that she had learned to crawl in order to get to the dog's dish. The stepmother ignored Germaine for days, and with this kind of treatment, she became even more ill. Instead of awakening Hortense's pity, this only made her despise Germaine more for being even uglier in her eyes. Germaine found no sympathy and love from her siblings. Watching their mother's treatment of their half-sister, they learned how to despise and torment her, putting ashes in her food and pitch in her clothes. Hortense did finally get concerned about Germaine's sickness because she was afraid her own children would catch it. So she made Germaine sleep out in the barn. The only warmth Germaine had on frozen winter nights was the woolly sheep who slept there too. The only food she had were the scraps Hortense might remember to throw her way. She tended the family's flock of sheep every day, another way to keep the ugly child out of her stepmother's sight. Besides minding the sheep, Germaine was required to spin a certain amount of wool every day. It is difficult to see how, with her crippled arm and hand, she could do this work since it called for considerable skill and dexterity. But it was required of her even when the weather was so cold that her fingers were stiff and hard to move. Nothing Germaine did, however hard she tried, would please her stepmother, who found one excuse after another to vent her inhumane rage upon Germaine. This little girl was frequently covered with bruises and welts from a woman drunk with hate. Germaine, though, turned this banishment into a closer relationship with the divine. From the meadow where Germaine was herding sheep, she could see the parish church, whose lofty tower resounded every morning with the silvery voice of the bell calling the faithful to Mass. One day, feeling so ardent a desire to attend the holy sacrifice, she called her sheep together and planted her spindle in the ground next to them. Then, making the sign of the cross, she ran to church. Germaine was overjoyed when she returned to discover her sheep were quietly resting about the distaff and under the shade of an oak tree. She began to repeat this same practice. And though the place was infested with wolves, which committed ravages on other flocks, she never lost a sheep or lamb. Rain. Snow or storm 
never prevented her from following this holy practice. Many times, neighbors would be mystified, finding Germaine's flock huddled obediently around her distaff. Her sheep, guarded by what she called her guardian angel, were never attacked by the wolves that prowled the French countryside. One day, after a strong rain, the creek had become a raging stream, making it impossible for her to reach the church. Two peasants of the region, who knew her custom to attend daily mass, came to laugh at her predicament. They saw the poor shepherdess walk straight toward the river without any hesitation. As she set her foot in the raging stream, the waters separated allowing her to cross. Just as the waters of the Jordan had opened for the Ark of the Covenant to pass, after she reached the other side, the waters returned to their tumultuous course. The peasants watched this with awe and fear, and then reported the miracle to the whole village. She shared spiritual stories with the local children. She often gave her meager food scraps to beggars. Although she never went to school, she was a diligent pupil in the School of Divine Love. The catechism that was taught by verbal instruction, both from the pulpit and in the little Sunday school class, she learned by heart, storing it in her memory pondering it diligently throughout the week. Often, she would stay in church long after everyone else had left, kneeling for hours on the hard flagstone floor. Germaine's profile grew one winter when her stepmother accused her of stealing bread to give to a beggar and hiding it in her apron. Her stepmother pursued her into town. hoping to expose her to the townspeople as a miscreant and a thief who was stealing from her household pantry. After catching up with her in the public square, she forced her to reveal the contents of her apron. When Germaine opened her apron, it wasn't bread that came flowing out, but summer flowers. It was the middle of winter. Everyone was amazed and began to see Germaine in a different light. The stepmother, however, was unmoved and continued to persecute the young girl until her death. This wasn't for much longer, as Germaine soon died alone in the barn where she had been forced to live for 17 years. One night, two traveling monks decided to take refuge for the night in a forest near Pibrac. They were sleeping when they were suddenly awakened by the sound of a marvelous singing. They looked and saw two angels amidst a splendorous light who were passing through the forest towards Pibrac. The vision disappeared, but after a while, the group reappeared again. This time, the cortege of virgins was coming from Pibrac, but one more virgin had joined the group. It was Germaine, wearing on her forehead a crown of fresh flowers. The monks were charmed by this heavenly vision and spread news of it everywhere. The following morning, Germain did not appear to take charge of the sheep. Her father went to seek her in the cubicle and found her dead on her simple pallet under the stairs. She had fallen into her final earthly sleep. She was 22 years old when she died. Her legacy grew, but it was not until her body was accidentally exhumed nearly half a century later that Her Holiness was fully realized. 
When uncovered, it was discovered that Germain Cousin's body was incorrupt. What's more, the scars left from a lifetime of illness and neglect were faded. With this realization, the village reminisced on her life and deeds, and many more miracles were attributed to her, mostly in the form of healings and interventions on behalf of the abused and disabled. In 1864, more than 250 years after her death, Saint Germain was canonized as patron saint of people with disabilities and those who have been abused or abandoned. Oh, Saint Germain, look down from heaven and intercede for the many abused children in our world. Help them to sanctify these sufferings. Strengthen children who suffer the effects of living in broken families. Protect those children who have been abandoned by their parents and who live on the streets. Beg God's mercy on the parents who abuse their children. Intercede for the handicapped children and their parents. Saint Germain, you who suffered neglect and abuse so patiently, pray for us. Amen. May 15th is the feast day of Saint Dymphna, a young woman of great courage. She is the patroness of the mentally and emotionally ill and other nervous disorders. How did this come to pass? Let us learn the incredible and heart-wrenching story of Saint Dymphna today. The first thing to say is that the story of Saint Dymphna, also spelled Dymphna with a Y and Dymphna with an I, is shrouded in mystery and uncertainty, but there is no question of a tradition of invoking her for the mentally ill. The earliest historical account of veneration of the saint dates from the middle of the 13th century in Belgium, where the Irish Saint Dymphna died and was buried in the 7th century. The author of the account, a canon of the Church of Saint Aubert at Cambrai, wrote a life of the saint commissioned by the Bishop of Cambrai, Guy I. He states expressly that the basis for his biography was oral tradition. Saint Dymphna was born in 7th century Ireland to an Irish king or warlord named Damon, who was a pagan. Her mother was very beautiful and a Christian. Dymphna's mother imparted the Christian faith to her daughter and had her secretly baptized against her father's wishes. When Dymphna was 14, she consecrated herself to Christ and took a vow of chastity. Her mother tragically died while Saint Dymphna was only a teenager. Damon loved his wife dearly, and after her death, his mental health declined greatly. His moody silences pushed him on the verge of mental collapse. His courtiers suggested he consider a second marriage. The king agreed on condition that his new bride should look exactly like his former one. His envoys went far afield in search of the woman he desired. They searched for a queen in distant lands for many months, but their quest proved fruitless. Then one of them had a brilliant idea. Why shouldn't the king marry his daughter, the living likeness of her mother? The king was appalled at first. Then, when the courtiers pressed him again, he too thought this was a good idea. He then began to desire his daughter, who bore a strong resemblance to her mother. Dymphna, who had made a vow of virginity before God, was horrified by her father's proposal and adamantly refused. The king was very angry at her. To escape the king's inevitable outrage over her rejection, Dymphna fled the kingdom. She was accompanied by her confessor, Father Gerobernus, 
as well as faithful servants from her father's court. On landing in Antwerp, on the coast of Belgium, they looked around for a place to stay. In the little village of Giel, they settled near a shrine dedicated to St. Martin of Tours. According to one tradition, Dymphna built a hospital using the money she brought from her palace. Dymphna dedicated herself to the care of the impoverished and sick. The mentally ill, in particular, found refuge in her kindness. And it wasn't long before Dymphna developed a reputation for her charity. Unfortunately, her good deeds were not to go unpunished. Her father's men were searching throughout the land for her. After a few months, the spies tracked her down as she used the coins she got from Ireland. They reported this to Damon, who then went to Belgium to try to take Dymphna back to Ireland. He had Gerobernus decapitated on sight, a martyrdom for which the old priest would later be canonized. He once again proclaimed his romantic love for his daughter and begged her to return to Ireland as his wife. When this approach failed, he tried threats and insults, but these two left Dymphna unmoved. She would not change her mind, staying true to her vow of virginity and refusal to enter an incestuous relationship. In a fit of rage, he beheaded her, his own daughter. According to tradition, she was only 15 years old when she died. The people of the town buried the two bodies in a cave near Giel. Word of her sacrifice spread quickly, and it wasn't long before people began making pilgrimages to Giel to visit the place where the Christian girl laid down her life. She was declared patroness of those with mental problems because of the great anguish her father's mental affliction caused. St. Dymphna's story should give all of us courage and strength especially that through her God has provided a powerful patroness for those suffering from mental and emotional disorders. Saint Agatha is recognized by the church as a virgin and a martyr. We are certain of her martyrdom but there are many stories told about her life. As in many stories, almost nothing is historically certain about this saint, except that she was martyred in Sicily during the persecution of Emperor Decius in 251. Saint Agatha was born in circa 231 AD to a rich, noble family in Catania, a region in Sicily. Christianity was outlawed in the Roman Empire at that time, and the ruling emperor, Emperor Trajan Decius, even had Pope Fabian executed. The name Agatha comes from the ancient Greek word for good. From her very early years, the notably beautiful Agatha dedicated her life to God. It is generally believed that when she was 21, she became a deaconess in the church as she is often seen in paintings from as early as the 6th century, wearing a white tunic, typical of the rank of deaconesses during her time. Her duties would have included teaching young followers about the Christian faith and to prepare them for baptism and holy communion. But her good deeds did not stop men from desiring her and making unwanted advances toward her. Her great beauty, charm, and social position soon captivated the heart of Quintianus, the prefect of Sicily. He became deeply enchanted by Agatha and made several advances towards her, but Agatha rejected all of them. Quintianus was a man of enormous power, and he decided to compel her to become his wife. The edicts of Emperor Decius against the Christians was in order, and Quintianus decided to use this edict to his advantage. He ordered Agatha to be arrested for following Christianity and conducted to Catania, 
where he then resided. He had hoped that the threat of death and torture would persuade Agatha to marry him. But he was wrong. He expected her to give in to his demands when she was faced with torture and possible death. But she simply reaffirmed her belief in God by praying, Jesus Christ, Lord of all, you see my heart. You know my desires. Possess all that I am. I am your sheep. Make me worthy to overcome the devil. With tears falling from her eyes, she prayed for courage. Quintianus found her presumably guilty of Christian superstition and in reprisal ordered her into the house of Aphrodisia, a wicked woman of unsavory fame and of evil reputation. In this evil way, he hoped to smear the church and lead St. Agatha from the path of Christian virtue and honor. Agatha suffered a month of assaults and torture in the evil house of Aphrodisia. The women tortured her to abandon her vow to God and go against her virtue. However, during this period of imprisonment, Saint Agatha was resolute in her determination to maintain both her faith and chastity. The messengers informed the prefect that the efforts of Aphrodisia had been in vain. Agatha was brought before him once again. During her interrogation, she told him that to be a servant of Jesus Christ was her true freedom. At this point in the martyrdom of St. Agatha, there exists different harrowing versions of St. Agatha's torture. According to the most authentic of ancient tradition, Quintianus, in a backlash of anger, commanded that St. Agatha be condemned to torture. He had her stretched on a rack to be torn with iron hooks, burned with torches, and whipped. The prefect saw that Agatha was enduring all the torture with a sense of cheer. He got even more angry and ordered that her breasts be cut off. It is said that she responded to this horrible mutilation by saying to Quintianus, Cruel man, have you forgotten your mother and the breast that nourished you, that you dare to mutilate me this way? Quintianus then remanded the saint to prison, commanding that her wounds should be left undressed. He thought she might give up her faith while suffering from the pain. She was returned to her cell without giving any medical attention to her wounds. As Agatha, gravely hurt, sat in her cell, an old man with medicine appeared before her. He was none other than St. Peter. He offered his prayers for comfort and encouraged her to be strong. He then perfectly cured her wounds and freed her from all pain. After revealing himself, he disappeared. Throughout the night, a light illuminated the dungeon. The guards left the doors wide open. They ran away in terror. Four days later, she was again led before the prefect. Quintianus, upon learning of the miracle of St. Peter, was filled with rage and furiously directed that at the saint. In anger, he ordered further torture, mockingly asking, Now I will see if your Christ will cure you. He commanded that she should be rolled over broken tiles, mixed with burning coals. But no sooner was she placed upon a blazing pyre than a violent earthquake shook the city of Catania. Two walls collapsed, burying two of the governor's men in the debris. While she lay burning on the coals, her veil stayed miraculously intact.
believing that this earthquake was inflicted upon their city because of the martyrdom of St. Agatha, the people of Catania demanded that she be immediately released. Quintianus became fearful for his own safety, and fearing an oppression, he ordered Agatha to be returned to prison. Back in prison, St. Agatha prayed, Lord, my Creator, you have ever protected me from the cradle. You have taken me from the love of this world and given me patience to suffer. Receive now my soul. Following this prayer, St. Agatha died. She was 20 years old at the time of her death in 251 AD. A mob of people then lifted her body and buried her in an elaborate tomb. It is said that a large group of mysterious men, well-dressed and beautiful, showed up among the mourners. They deposited an inscribed headstone for her and then were never seen in Sicily again. The people assumed that they were angels and revered Agatha all the more because of it. In the meantime, a mob of citizens chased off Quintianus. They were angry at his treatment of the Saint Agatha. While fleeing, Quintianus was attacked by his own horses while attempting to cross a river, causing him to drown and his body never to be found. In this young life, this great saint of God would be the inspiration of countless souls to follow our Lord and his mother. Saint Agatha is one of seven women, including the Blessed Virgin Mary, who is commemorated in the canon of the Mass. Saint Agatha, you suffered sexual assault and indignity because of your faith and purity. Help heal all those who are survivors of sexual assault and protect those women who are in danger. Amen. A long time ago, there lived a well-respected couple in Rocca Purana named Antonio and Amata Lodi. They were the village peacemakers who helped everyone in the town of Rocca Purana get along. When there was a disagreement, Rita's parents helped people discuss the problem to reach agreements and forgive one another. Rita was born in the year 1381. Her parents, Antonio and Amata Lodi, considered her birth a very special gift from God, for Rita was born to them as they were already advancing in age. She was named Margarita. In the local dialect, her name meant Pearl, but she was simply known as Rita. Rita's parents were very wise and Rita learned the importance of pardon and reconciliation from them. As a young girl, Rita frequently visited the covenant of the Augustinian nuns in Caskia and dreamed of one day joining their community. Hello, friend. How are you doing today? One of her favorite places to go was the Church of St. Augustine, where she would pray to God and to all the saints that she called her friends. Rita's three favorite saints were St. Augustine of Hippo, St. John the Baptist, and St. Nicholas of Tolentine. But her parents had different plans. Her parents, however, had promised her in marriage, according to the custom of the day, to Paolo Mancini, a good man of strong and impetuous character. Rita, being an obedient daughter, agreed to her parents' decision and married Paolo. Together, Paolo and Rita had two sons. Rita was a good wife and a loving mother, and together the family lived a simple life of faith and love. In the troubling political climate of the times, there was often open conflict between families. Paolo was the victim of one such conflict 
and he was murdered when their sons were still young. Rita was very sad and knew what had happened. Paolo's family had been fighting with another family for a long time, and every once in a while, someone would get hurt or even killed. The families refused to forgive one another. Instead, they kept hurting one another and then would seek revenge. You should never let them sleep peacefully, boy. You must avenge your father's death. The society at the time expected that the boys should avenge the murder of their father to defend family honor. Rita, however, influenced by the peacemaking example of her parents, pledged to forgive her husband's killers. You have to forgive them. You must let it go. Otherwise, there will be no peace. But Rita's two teenage sons did not feel very forgiving. They wanted to get even. Now, at the same time all this was happening, there was a severe illness sweeping through that area of Italy, making many people sick and die. Before Rita's sons could seek revenge on their father's murderers, both of them got very ill and died. Despite her great burden, she could still thank God. Thank you, God, for they have died in peace, free of the poison of murder. They were getting drawn to hatred and revenge, which would have soon consumed them. Now alone in the world and without family responsibilities, Rita once more turned her thoughts to the desired vocation of her youth that of joining the Augustinian nuns of St. Mary Magdalene Monastery. She went to the convent in Caskia and asked to join the nuns there. Sister, it has been my wish since I was a child to join this convent. Please let me in. But the sisters at St. Mary Magdalene Monastery were hesitant and refused her request. Although the nuns liked Rita and knew how faithful and forgiving she was, they also knew about Paolo's death. They knew that Paolo's family and the family responsible for his death had not forgiven each other, and they were still fighting. The nuns feared that if Rita entered their convent, these families will somehow follow her and hurt the convent. Disheartened she implored her three patron saints, John the Baptist, Augustine, and Nicholas of Tolentino to assist her, and that's when she realized what she must do. I have to make peace. She went to her husband's family and exhorted them to put aside their hostility and stubbornness. They were convinced by her courage and agreed. Rita went to the family who had murdered her husband and told them the same thing. It is time for peace. The rival family, astounded by this overture of peace and by the suffering she had endured, the family agreed. Rita was successful in establishing peace between two hostile families for tens of generations. She had achieved the impossible. She was finally allowed entry into the monastery. At the age of 36, Rita pledged to follow the ancient rule of St. Augustine. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for giving me the chance to serve you. Even while staying in the covenant, she put her peacemaking skills to good use. She was frequently visited by people from town who needed help forgiving one another. For the next 40 years, she gave herself wholeheartedly to prayer and works of charity. The poor and needy often visited her, and she would never turn them away. For 40 years, she lived a regular life of prayer, contemplation, and spiritual reading 
according to the rule of St. Augustine. One Good Friday, Rita was deep in prayer. She was thinking about Jesus' suffering on the cross. Because she was such a kind and generous person, Rita told Jesus of her greatest wish. Oh, Jesus, how I wish I could ease some of the pain you experience on the cross. She prayed this with such pure love, and she wanted more and more to intimately join the suffering of Jesus. This desire of hers was satisfied in an extraordinary way. Suddenly, a small wound appeared on her forehead, as though a thorn from the crown that encircled Christ's head had loosed itself and penetrated her own flesh. The stigmata remained on Rita's head for the rest of her life, a sign that Jesus had recognized her great love for him and accepted her offer by allowing her to carry one of the signs of his passion. For the next 15 years, she bore this external sign of stigmatization and union with the Lord. In spite of the pain she constantly experienced, She offered herself courageously for the physical and spiritual well-being of others. Rita was confined to bed during the last four years of her life. She was able to eat so little that she was practically sustained on the Eucharist alone. The nuns in the monastery were greatly moved by her faith in Jesus, and they looked up to her. Toward the end of her life, Rita progressively weakened physically. Several months before her death, she was visited by a relative from Rocco Perena, who asked if there was anything she could do for the ailing woman. Rita at first declined, but then made a simple request. Bring me a rose from my garden. But that was impossible. It was January in Kaskia, and snow covered the hills for miles around. No roses could bloom in that snow. Nevertheless, on returning home, the woman discovered, to her amazement, a single brightly colored blossom on the bush where the nun said it would exactly be. She picked the flower and ran back to the convent. Rita knew this rose was a sign from God that her many years of prayer for her sons and her husband had been answered and that she would see them in heaven again soon. She breathed her last. Rita's final words to the sisters who gathered around her were, Remain in the holy love of Jesus. Remain in obedience to the holy Roman Church. Remain in peace and fraternal charity. Rita died peacefully on May 22, 1457. The bells of the convent immediately began to ring, untouched by human hands, calling the people of Kaskia to the doors of the convent and to announce the triumphant completion of a life faithfully lived. As the nuns prepared her for the final burial, a carpenter, paralyzed by a stroke, wished, If only I were well, I would have prepared a coffin worthy of you. (laughs) It was then that the first miracle happened. The carpenter was healed completely as soon as he said those words. He was overjoyed and ran to the convent. The people who knew him were shocked to see him running toward them. It's a miracle! I am healed! He then made an elaborate and richly decorated coffin that would preserve Rita's remains for centuries. It is still incorrupt today now in a glass-enclosed coffin in the Basilica of Kaskia. Her feast is observed on the anniversary of her death, 
22 May. Pray for us, O holy Saint Rita, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Amen. Saint Lorenzo Ruiz is a Filipino saint venerated in the Catholic Church. A Chinese Filipino, he became his country's proto-martyr after his execution in Japan by the Tokugawa shogunate during its persecution of Japanese Christians in the 17th century. Lorenzo was born around 1600 in the Binondo district of Manila to a Catholic, Chinese, and Filipino couple. His father taught him Chinese, while his mother taught him Tagalog. The Spaniards ruled over the lands for 333 years, and because of this, Lorenzo spoke three languages, Tagalog, Spanish, and Chinese. He attended a school run by Spanish Dominican friars, as well as serving as an altar boy and a sacristan for the church in his district of Manila. The Dominicans, for their part, taught Lorenzo Spanish, as well as how to read and write. So good was his penmanship that he eventually became a professional calligrapher and a clerk. Inspired by the Dominicans, Lorenzo joined the confraternity of the Holy Rosary. Contemporaries noticed, in a particular way, his honesty and trustworthiness to the point that the Dominican friars made him their unofficial messenger as well. Lorenzo grew up and married a Filipino woman named Rosario and with her had three children. He continued to work as a clerk and as a translator for the Spaniards and their life remained normal. Lorenzo kept his close ties with the Dominicans and helped them in ministering to the people in Manila, especially those in the Binondo district. He led a peaceful and content life. His normal life took a bad turn when he was implicated in the murder of a Spaniard one day. Nothing further is known except the statement of two Dominicans that he was sought by the authorities on account of a homicide to which he was present or which was attributed to him. Ruiz couldn't trust the courts. He knew that much. A lifetime of colonial inequality had taught him that a legal battle between Spaniards and Filipinos under Spanish laws wasn't a legal battle at all. He knew that he couldn't turn to the government for help. He decided to leave his home and seek a safe place to hide for a while. He said goodbye to Rosario and left home in the darkness of night. He confided his problem to Father Domingo Gonzalez, a Dominican priest. The priest was kind towards Lorenzo and he was allowed to board their ship. Little did Lorenzo know that they were part of a secret missionary to Japan. Lorenzo was under the impression that they were headed to Macau. He was quite surprised when they told him that they were headed to Japan. The three Dominican priests were Saint Antonio Gonzalez, Saint Guillermo Cortet, and Saint Miguel de Azora and Saint Miguel de Azoraza. There was a Japanese priest present named Saint Vicente Shiwazuka de la Cruz, and also a lay leper, Saint Lazaro of Kyoto. All of them sailed for Okinawa on June 10, 1636. As soon as the group landed in Japan, they were arrested. A violent persecution against Christians was being enforced by Emperor Tokugawa Yamitsu to prevent the spread of Christianity in Japan. The missionaries were arrested and thrown into prison, and after two years, they were transferred to Nagasaki to face trial by torture. 
the group endured many and various cruel methods of torture. Back in Manila, Rosario never heard a word from Lorenzo, and no one knew what had become of him. Once the group of missionaries reached Nagasaki, they were to face trials and torture for being a Christian. The emperor gave them an offer. They could leave Japan as long as they were willing to renounce their faith. The missionaries agreed to leave Japan, but they said they will never renounce their faith. This made the shogun lord extremely furious, for none has ever refused the shogunate before. Unaccustomed to rejection, the shoguns considered the group's decision as an insult to their empire and immediately sent the prisoners to their slow and painful execution. While they were put back in the jail, they witnessed the tortures other prisoners had to endure for not obeying the emperor. The prisoners were forced to drink inhuman amounts of water. They were stabbed, pressed, soaked, and repeatedly crushed. Their captors emphasized that the torture would stop if they renounced their faith. When Lorenzo saw this, he got terrified for a moment. It was just a moment when he fell into a spiritual darkness. He quickly prayed the rosary and found relief and had more courage than before. He even started comforting his companions in jail asking them to have faith in the Lord's grand plan. That night, he prayed the rosary as often as he could. Then came the day of execution. The missionaries were subjected to water torture first. Despite the painful torture, the men refused to renounce their faith. Following this, the soldiers hung the missionaries upside down over a large pit. One among the soldiers took pity on Lorenzo and persuaded him to renounce his faith to end his agony. Lorenzo answered, This I will never do, because I am a Christian, and I shall die for God, and for him I would give many thousands of lives if I had them. And so, do with me as you please. Lorenzo died from bleeding and suffocation, and so did the other missionaries. Saint Lorenzo Ruiz died as he lived, a servant of the Lord. There are countless miracles attributed to Saint Lorenzo Ruiz. The one that stands out the most was the story of Cecilia Allegria Policarpio, a two-year-old girl suffering from a rare brain disease. One night, as her family and supporters prayed to Ruiz for his intercession, the saint appeared to her in a vision. In her recollection, Cecilia said she was lying on her bed, unable to move from the pain when she noticed a light. She remembered seeing a man holding a rosary looking up to the heavens. The following morning, her illness was completely gone. She was able to sit on the bed by herself for the first time in her life. Lorenzo was beatified by Pope John Paul II on February 18, 1981. The beatification ceremony was held in the Philippines, making it the first beatification ceremony ever held outside the Vatican. His canonization took place at the Vatican on October 18, 1987. Saint Lorenzo Ruiz is the patron saint of Filipino youth, the Philippines, people working overseas, and altar servers. Saint Veronica Giuliani is one of the most powerful saints that has been forgotten. So powerful that Padre Pio considered her as his teacher. 
Pope Pius IX said she was not merely a saint, but a great saint. Pope Leo XIII said no other being except the mother of Jesus was more endowed than her with preternatural gifts. Let's learn about this amazing saint today. Ursula Giuliani, who will later become Sister Veronica, was born on December 27, 1660, in Mercatello, a small village in the province of Marche in Italy. Her father, Francisco, was in charge of the local regiment with the rank of second lieutenant. His marriage to Benedicta Mancini had given him seven girls, two of which died at a very tender age. Ursula was the last one and, like the others, grew in a very pious environment, created most of all by her mother. Growing up, Ursula would listen with her sisters to her mother tell the stories of the saints. As St. Veronica's mother was dying, she consecrated each of her five living daughters to the five wounds of Jesus. To Ursula, her mother said, You, dear Ursulina, still so young, will reside in the wound of the side. The little girl was only seven years old and didn't fully understand the implications of her mother's words. Nevertheless, this was the beginning of Ursula's betrothal to Jesus' heart, the very heart which bled on the cross. Her mother died before she reached her 40th birthday, leaving Ursula and her four surviving siblings to their father's care. Even from early childhood, Ursula showed unusual signs of devotion and had her first vision and locution of Christ at age four. From a very young age, Ursula courageously endured small and great daily sufferings and encountered Christ through acts of charity. She saw Christ crucified in everyone, especially the poor. She once met an old beggar in dire need of charity. With barely anything to offer him, she gave him her favorite pair of shoes. Years later, St. Veronica noted in her diary, This poor man seemed more beautiful to me than any other living being I had seen. And one day, as she prayed, Christ appeared to her and gave her a pair of golden shoes, saying, These are the shoes you gave me when you were a child. I was that poor beggar. When she received her first Holy Communion at age 10, she knew she had a vocation to consecrated religious life. Francisco wished for Ursula to be married and arranged for several suitors to court her, but she refused. At last, he gave his consent for her to begin a religious life. At the age of 17, Ursula entered the cloistered monastery of the Capuchin Poor Clares in Cita di Castello. The bishop who performed the rite of her entrance predicted to the nuns that she would become a great saint one day. He chose for her the religious name Veronica in honor of the woman who is known traditionally to have comforted Christ during his walk to Calvary. During her novitiate, the visions of Veronica's childhood continued, and she continued to be drawn toward meditation on Christ's suffering. In her diaries, she spoke of her conversations with Jesus and claimed he would tell her which specific people she should pray for and who. In another mystic vision, she said that while she was working in the infirmary, the figure of Christ detached himself from the cross and held her in his embrace, saying, All this that I am now doing to you, I do it for you to know how pleased I am with your prayers. 
Imbued with sincere humility, she considered herself the lowliest member of the community. In 1682, she was chosen to serve as novice mistress, and she guided her young sisters with much care. She served in this capacity for 34 years. In 1693, in obedience to her confessor, she began writing her diary. She wrote faithfully for the remainder of her life, compiling 22,000 pages of written text. Considering her other responsibilities, the writing of her diary often required her to write very late into the night. She would frequently experience demonic attacks while she wrote, but the Lord made it clear to her that He wanted her to write. During the course of these many years of mystical visions, Veronica had several visions of hell and of purgatory. At one of these experiences, she offered herself as a doorway, standing in the breach of the gate of hell to try to turn away souls while they still had time to repent. The Virgin Mary told her that many people do not believe that hell exists, and this is to their peril. In 1694, Veronica experienced a vision where Christ showed her St. Catherine of Siena, another extraordinary mystic and gave her to Veronica as a guide and companion. In 1696, Veronica received the beginning of the stigmata wounds, a wound to the heart from her side, a phenomenon similarly experienced by Saints Teresa of Avila and Philip Neri. She described the wound as feeling like a constantly burning flame. When the marks of the stigmata appeared on her head and body, Veronica's bishop removed her from ordinary convent life and kept her under constant observation. Veronica was deposed from her office as novice mistress and deprived of every suffrage in the community. She was even imprisoned in a remote cell. No sisters were permitted to talk to her and a lay sister who was made her warden was ordered to treat her like a deceiver. It was only when he was satisfied the marks were authentic that he allowed her back into the convent to continue her service. The following year, on Good Friday, she received the remaining stigmata wounds, those to her hands and feet. She wrote that they came to her as stunning rays from the wounds of Christ crucified that she experienced in a vision, nearly identical to the experience of Saints Francis of Assisi and Pio. In 1716, Veronica was elected abbess and served in that role for the rest of her life. Despite her extraordinary spiritual life, she was a very friendly leader for her sisters. She enlarged the convent, had running water installed, and guided her charges with good common sense. She was 66 years old at the time of her death. An autopsy revealed that her heart bore the imprints of the cross and several of the instruments of Jesus' passion. The life of St. Veronica Giuliani was truly extraordinary. She was given the gift to see the invisible spiritual realities that are mercifully veiled from the rest of us. Like a number of more well-known mystics and stigmatics, she accepted the burdens and gifts with a willing and obedient spirit. She was tremendously devoted to the passion of Christ and he chose her to participate in that passion in her own time for the salvation of souls in a very special way. Oh 
God, who declare that you abide in the hearts that are pure, grant that through the intercession of the Virgin Blessed Veronica, we may be so fashioned by your grace that we become a dwelling pleasing to you. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.